So when we left a couple of weeks ago, John 6, two miracles had just taken place. Jesus had, uh, Jesus had fed 5,000 men. When you add in the, the wives and the kids, that was probably a miracle of feeding 15 to 20,000 people. And it was such an astonishing miracle, you can, we, we won't take the time to read it, it's there in John 6, that they wanted to make him king and they wanted him to be the, the Messiah who would overthrow Rome. They hated being under the domain of Rome and they wanted him to take over and to relieve them of the Roman oppression. And they wanted the Jewish Messiah, they wanted the Jewish government, that was their hope. But that was not the time for that to happen or occur. So he, he went stealth through that mob, told the disciples to get into the boat. The people begin to disperse, he goes up on the mountain to pray. And then that night, a storm hits. The disciples were going to go six, seven, eight miles uh, to the west, to Capernaum, along the, the shoreline, maybe a mile out or so. And as is not unusual on the Sea of Galilee because of the topography and because it's 700 feet below sea level, these great storms just kick up out of nowhere. They come up from the north, down from uh, Lebanon and the Golan Heights, and suddenly you've got a tumultuous storm. So what should have been a pretty easy road just over near Capernaum, uh, these guys are rowing all night and they're exhausted and they're rowing roughly from probably 6 p.m. until somewhere between 3 to 6 a.m. And instead of going the direction they want to go, they're being blown off course. You know, it's always interesting in the Christian life when you find yourself blown off course. It's the last thing you want to have happen because you've got a schedule and you've got objectives and you have things you're trying to achieve and, uh, and you get blown off course. And you know that God controls the elements. So really, he's the one who's blowing you off course. So that's what's happened to these guys. They're, uh, they're on the Sea of Galilee. They're absolutely fatigued. They're worn out. They're, they're not even close to their destination. And at a certain point, they see Jesus walking on the water. This is not in John. It's in another gospel where it's recorded that Peter says to the Lord, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come and walk. And he does. He walks on water. And then he starts looking at the waves and thinking, what the heck am I doing here? And he begins to sink like a rock, and Jesus reaches out and grabs him. They get into the boat. And it's interesting, because as soon as they got into the boat, the Bible says they immediately reached their destination. Which shows that Jesus is the Son of God over nature. He's God over nature. He's God over time. He's God over, over space. He's God over history. He's God over everything. That's kind of the background of where we were last time. And tonight, if you have your Bible, turn with me to John 6. I, I want you to note what happens in 22. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. In other words, they're starting to, they're kind of figuring out, wait a minute, something happened overnight. Yeah, there was a big storm, but well, where, where's Jesus? And where, they're, they're trying to put the pieces together. Uh, there came other boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So where's Jesus? That's the big question. Where's Jesus? 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? 
Now here, I want, I want to observe something right here. They ask him a direct question, and what's very interesting is that he completely ignores it and does not give them an answer. The reason I point this out is because often this is our experience in the Christian life. Uh, nothing wrong with asking questions, but we find ourselves uh, being blown off course. We find ourselves uh, in some kind of setback or circumstances we did not foresee or circumstances that have uh, uh, come up out of nowhere and put, un put us under great duress and uh, caused problems that we had not anticipated. We really don't have a backup plan for it. And, it's, uh, and, and, and we ask the Lord, Lord, what's, what's going on here? And, we, and we're totally ignored and we get no response. Now, it's not always that way, but sometimes it's that way. And we should be ready for it when it happens. If, if the Lord does that, it's, if he doesn't answer a question that's a legitimate question, and he doesn't answer it at the time we're asking, there must be a reason for it. And the reason for it is that he's got something else in mind that is of much more importance than the answer to the question that has been foremost on our mind. In other words, he wants to get to something that's of greater importance than what's on the front burner of our heads and our minds. We, we, we can do without an explanation right now, but we need to understand some truth. Um, tonight, what I want to do is I want to make uh, five observations uh, out of this text, and we're, we're going to contrast spiritual blindness, spiritual blindness with spiritual conversion. So let me go ahead and give you five principles, and then we'll work our way through this text. Because this is very practical stuff. It's very practical where we are right now. Where everything is just upside down. Uh, in, in Canada, it's upside down. In Australia and New Zealand. Uh, countries, democracies that have been, they've gone com totally authoritarian in a matter of weeks. And it's happening quickly. There is... Um, well, you, 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 I'm not even going to describe it. You're, you're aware of it. You're reading about it. You're watching it. It's astonishing. And it, it's interesting that we've got these principles on the docket tonight because these are principles that we need to be applying as we look at what's going on around us. So the first principle, and then I, we'll, we'll give them to you. I'll give you all five, and then I'll come back, and we'll break them down. First principle is this. The danger of spiritual blindness to Jesus Christ. That's John 6, verses 22 to 26. Secondly, spiritual blindness does the work of earth, but ignores the work of eternity. Let me say that again. Spiritual blindness does the work of earth on earth to make a living, but ignores the work of eternity. Number three, spiritual blindness is cured by spiritual conversion, which means you continually come and believe in Christ. Fourthly, when God converts us, he is calling us as individuals to bring order out of chaos. That's what happens when we're born again. That's what happens when Christ comes into our life. When everyone else is panicking, you don't have to panic. When, when everyone else is dropping meds because they're so anxious, they, they don't... They, they can't even function. There is a peace which passes all understanding, and it all has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Fifth principle is three truths about spiritually blind people that you love. 
three truths about spiritually blind people that you love because there are people you care about, people that you dearly love, that um, you've been praying for, but they're spiritually blind. Maybe they were their adult kids that you've raised and you tried to teach them about the Lord, and, but they're so far away and they're so hard-hearted and they mock what you taught them and they are, they absolutely have no interest whatsoever. And if that's descriptive of someone in your life that grieves your heart and there's a burden you carry for them they're spiritually blind, but there are three truths that will encourage us as we finish this out tonight. So let's go back to the first one. The danger of spiritual blindness to Jesus Christ. And we looked at John 6, verses 22 to 26. They said, Rabbi, when did you get here? In verse 26, Jesus answered and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. All right, so it says earlier than John that Jesus knows the hearts of all men. So he knows these guys. He knows what they're thinking. He knows what's on their minds. He knows that uh, most of them are followers of Moses. That, that was real clear in John chapter 5. They they held Moses in the highest esteem. Now Jesus had just done a miracle the day before where he had taken the bread and the fish and he had uh, just kept making the fish fish and more bread into more bread and fed the 15 to 20,000. But now it's the next morning and these guys are hungry. And what they're looking for is they're looking for another meal they're looking for another handout. And then in verse 27, he makes a statement to them. And, and, and he, again, he knows what's in their heart in 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now watch this. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures for eternal life which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Um, Jesus isn't saying that we shouldn't work, that we shouldn't provide for our families, that we shouldn't get up and do our task. And he's not saying that at all. In fact, the Scripture says the opposite. Paul said that if, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Now, if someone's in legitimate need, we take care of them and we help them and we assist them. Marvin Olasky wrote a book, uh, you'll recognize the title uh, from, well, Compassionate Conservatism, but he wrote it from a, a biblical standpoint. Before the government got involved in taking care of needs of people, how, how were people taken care of in this country, historically? They were taken care of by churches. They were taken care of by Christian people. And, and people looked out for their neighbor, and churches went out of their way, and there were soup kitchens, and different ministries, and hospitals had Christian roots. And even today, you'll see a hospital one with Christian roots. They may not believe the gospel anymore, but they're associated with perhaps John Wesley and Methodism or with a Baptist group of hospitals or with, you understand what I'm saying. So there's a history to this, but at a certain point, it gradually was given over to the government and we won't take any time to trace that through, but everything has suddenly changed and now the government is in charge, and the government is God, and people look to the government as their savior, and as their Lord, and as their master, and as their provider, and things are so upside down right now that we're even paying people 
This, this is unimaginable just even three years ago. But we're paying people, we're paying healthy young men to not work. Well, you're just asking for trouble. When you've got healthy young men and you're paying them to sit around, that's what you call foolishness. That's what you call bureaucracy. That's what you call Job 12. We haven't looked at Job 12 for a while, but it, it would fit right here. In, in Job 12, there is a, there's a statement made, and it's, it's very clear about what happens when individuals and when um, nations turn away from the Lord. We know that's what's happening in this country as well as in other countries around us. Job, as you know, was the most righteous man on the face of the earth. Uh, he loved the Lord. He, he was a godly man. And Satan basically says to the Lord, the reason he loves you is because you have blessed him so much. Anyone would love you if you were to bless them in such a way. But if you would let me afflict him, I'll show you what's really in his heart. Uh, notice that Satan had to get permission from the father to afflict Job. But the father gave permission. And so these things happened to him in the first couple of chapters and uh, just excruciating. And in, in a matter of probably 45 minutes to an hour, he lost everything, including all of his children were killed in a natural disaster. And Job tears his clothes and he says, the Lord gives and Satan takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. You remember that passage? You, you don't remember because it's, it's not what it says. What it says is Job tore his clothes after all these things happened. He says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Most Christians today don't believe that. Most Christians today believe if something good happens, it comes from the Lord. If something bad happens, it comes from Satan. Number one, they don't know their Bibles. They're in churches where the Bibles aren't taught. Oh, they might carry Bibles, but in terms of digging into what it really says, that's not happening. So as a result, they're spiritual infants. And so when suffering comes along, they're not sure what to do. And there'll be a pastor or a preacher who'll just say, you need to sow more seed, i.e. money, into my ministry. And, it, you know, it's just a scam that's going on and it's everywhere. It's not what the scripture teaches. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because the Lord uses both things in our lives. He uses... Uh, prosperity and he's been good to us but he also uses adversity and really the most valuable lessons if you look back in your life the most valuable le lessons that you have ever learned have come out of the most difficult situations you've ever been in in your life it's just how it works it's a principle of life no one wants to go through hard things but good things come out of hard things when people are teachable to what God is trying to say. So you have a situation where Job has these friends and they're really not much, you would not want these guys signing your yearbook. They, they don't encourage him, all they do is just rip him up. And they're super spiritual and they've got all kinds of answers and they, they're just tearing this guy up. Uh, they're, they're not giving him any encouragement or hope so in Job 12, Job is responding to one of these accusers. And just picking it up, beginning with verse 9, Job 12, verse 9. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Now, there's a proper view of God. God is absolutely sovereign he controls all things. He controls all people. You cannot breathe without him. Uh, the duration of your life is in his hands. 
As for the days of our lives, they contain 70. Your due to strength, 80 years, but soon it is gone and we fly away. Psalm 90. Some get 70 years, some get 80, some get more, some get less. But that's all in the hands of God. It's appointed for a man once to die and then comes judgment. Your length of life, your days on the earth are determined by God before you are conceived. And Job knew this. He goes down to verse 16 and he speaks of the power of God. He says, with him, with God, are strength and sound wisdom. I, I love this. The misled and the misleader belong to him. I love that verse. Because a lot of times I get upset. Because I see people of influence lying through their teeth. They know they're lying. I know they're lying. You know they're lying. But they're Someone's covering for them, and like Teflon, they should have been in jail a long, 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 long time ago. But they'll never see that day. That bothers me. Until I read my Bible. And then I remember that there is a day of judgment and there is a day of reckoning that no one can escape except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 16, with him are strength and sound wisdom. The misled and the misleader belong to him. The, God controls them all. He, he, he's got it. He understands it better than we do. Of course he does. He's God. Now, this is what happens the further a nation gets away from God, the further the leadership of a nation gets away from God. As we've said before in here, you read Romans chapter 1, 18 down to the end of the chapter, there is a description of the spiritual insanity and the moral insanity that takes place when they're given over to reprobate minds. It says in verse 20 of Job 12, he deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. The elders are supposed to have discernment. The elders are supposed to be able to tell the difference between right and wrong. But you see, when you deny the truth about God, that will be removed from you because you want it removed. You suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, this is where we're living right now. Look at 23. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. Gosh, does that ring a bell at all? It sure does. He makes the nations great, then destroys them. He enlarges the nations, then leads them away. Now watch this. He deprives of intelligence the chiefs of the earth's people and makes them wander in a pathless waste. They grope in darkness with no light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. We're watching that every day in front of us. And God has it all in his hands. All of it. All of it. He's running it. He's calling the shots. Doesn't that help you? It helps me. That encourages my heart. This thing is not out of control. This thing is under control. Before I get too far off of John, let's go back to that first principle. The danger of spiritual blindness to Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, and, and, and really what's happening in that opening passage is these guys, you know, they, they want some more food, they want, but they are absolutely, they just tried to make the Lord Jesus, they just tried to make him the Jewish the Messiah, and tear down Roman oppression and all that. They are, they are utterly blind spiritually to who he is. It's astonishing the blindness they are completely missing that he is the son of God, which is the message of the gospel of John. And they're concerned just about their earthly everyday existence and who or what party can make their situation better. That's what they're interested in. But you see, the message of the gospel of John is that Jesus, Jesus is unlike anyone else. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. There are seven statements in the Gospel of John, seven I am, 
I am. Seven times Jesus says, I am. And this establishes, this establishes who he is. And the first one is in John 6, 35, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. They're, they're, you know, they want another meal. But what he's trying to teach these guys, what he wants to open their eyes to is, I am the bread of life. I'm the source of all life. I created life. I sustain life. I'm the God of life. In John 8, 12, he says this, I am the light of the world. So there's tremendous darkness. Yeah, but I'm the light. And you go back to the early chapters of Genesis, and you go back to the early chapters of the Gospel of John. In him was light. There's a third one in John 10, verses 7 and 9. He says, I am the door of the sheep. Uh, in other words, I am, I am the pathway. I am the only way to eternal salvation with the Father to have sins forgiven. And then in John 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. We know Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In John 10, it's all about, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, which is astonishing because he's God and he's without sin. Yet he took all our sin upon him and went to the cross. And he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. We didn't seek him, he sought us. This is the gospel right here. And then in John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I mean, these, these, are, these are astonishing claims. I am the resurrection and the life. And to prove it, he's gonna raise Lazarus from the dead. John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, in John 15, 1, he says, I am the true vine. I I'm the source of life. David Wells wrote a book a number of years ago, a great book. I love the title. And the title is simply this, Above All Earthly Powers. That's Jesus. He's above them all because he's God. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He upholds all things by the word of his power. That's who he is. He's in absolute control. He's in absolute charge. He knows exactly what he's doing in your life, in the, in the life of the nation, in all, all the people that you love and care about. He, he's got it. He's got it. And he's coming back one day and he's setting up his kingdom and all the injustice. You, you ever get upset because of injustice? Of course you do. There's all kinds of injustice. Here's the thing about injustice, and we, we do our best to, when, when there's injustice, we wanna do our best to make things right. But that's never gonna happen on this earth until Jesus comes back. The, the scripture says there is no injustice with God. It's impossible, God cannot be unjust. Christ is gonna come back, he's gonna set things right, he's gonna set up his kingdom, it's gonna be un believable and it's as fixed as anything can possibly be because it's the plan of God and this is why we have hope and this is why we do not fear and this is why he said in John 14 when they found out he was leaving and they were all upset they didn't want him to leave sometimes the Lord gives us news that um, that we don't want to hear and they didn't want to hear that he was leaving. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. I'm God's son. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come back and receive you unto myself. And they're probably thinking, what is he talking about? Because see, what, their, what their concern is, they just found out that Jesus is about to leave. They don't want him to leave. They've been with him for three years. The last thing they want him to do is to leave. That's all they heard. I, I, you're gonna leave? And then 
he begins to talk to them. Yes, I'm going to leave. And he begins to talk to them about eternity. Now, now follow this here and put yourself in their shoes. They don't want him to leave. And the last thing they care about right now is eternity. Wait a minute. Where are you going? How long are you going to be are you coming back? I mean, what, what is this you're leaving thing? Is this going to be a week or a couple of weekends? What is this? And he starts talking about eternity. To them, it made no sense. But you see, when you take a, te- a step back, it makes all kinds of sense. And this is what we have to do in the Christian life when we don't understand exactly what he's up to. We have to take a step back and think biblically. And really what he was saying to them, they were concerned that he was going to leave and it was going to be soon. And that's the last thing they wanted. How are we going to get along if you're not with us? Even if you send this comforter, how are we going to make it? And then what does he say? Let's not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, watch this, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Well, see, that didn't help them at all. And the reason it didn't help them is that they really weren't thinking. But when you stop and think about it, it makes all kinds of sense. Because here's the deal. They're worried about short-term inconvenience of a situation they can't make hide nor hair out of that he's not going to be with them anymore. But the point that Jesus was making, listen, I've got something in mind for eternity and I'm going to set it up and I'm going to prepare it. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and you're going to be with me forever. Now, if they had been thinking, they would have thought this way. Well, wait a minute. I don't know what he's going to do short term, but if that's what he's going to do long term, he's going to prepare a place, then he's going to come back and he's going to receive me unto himself. In other words, if he's able to do that, don't you think he'll, he's able to take care of me in the short term while he's not with me as he has been for the last three years? You see, when you reason it out, if he's got my eternity taken care of, I don't need to worry about my short term. Does that make sense? But you see, you got to think it through. Okay, wait a minute. You're God. You got eternity. You got it all set up. You got it fixed. And nothing can change it. And nothing can break it. That's exactly right. Wow, that's power. It can't be thwarted? No, it can't be thwarted. I've chosen you. You'll always be with me. Well, what does that do? That calms me down for what I don't understand right now. Because it's who he is. And see, he can only do that because he's above all earthly powers. You read Psalm 2 about the nations rebelling against God. These leaders, they think they have all this power. You know what Psalm 2 says? The Lord laughs. He laughs. He just laughs at them. Second point. See, it's very dangerous. To sum up the first one, it's extremely dangerous to be spiritually blind to the Lord Jesus Christ who is above all earthly powers and is God. That's your only hope. Secondly, He's going to talk about working back in John 6. And this could be misunderstood. You know, men are supposed to work. We work. We work with our hands. Colossians 3, whatever you do, do you work heartily, not as unto men, but as unto Christ. It's the Lord Christ whom you serve. So no matter what you do, if you program computers or you, you know, you you drive a tow truck or whatever you do, That's how you earn a living. That's how you provide for your family. That's how you take care of things. In 27, Jesus says, do not work for the food which perishes. He's obviously not telling these guys not to work. That's not not his point. But work for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Here's the second point. Spiritual blindness does the work of earth, but ignores the work of earth of eternity. This, this, is, this happens all the time. And this is an incredible blindness. I was reading last week in the Wall Street Journal. I uh, wasn't feeling that great. I'm just kind of, you know, browsing. And there's this article in the real estate section. Some very wealthy guy, wealthy family, um, just sold a penthouse on Park Avenue for some, you know, 119 million something. Oh, he died three years ago, by the way. 
but he bought it and the article was talking about how at the last minute before it closed, he was able to basically walk in and pull some kind of shenanigans and get it from another guy and took the guy to the cleaners. And that's kind of how he lived his life. But then went on to say he survived by his wife and they have two other properties, one in West Palm Beach and somewhere else. And then that I read, I actually read the day that they sold, uh, was it 80,000 acre ranch in Montana? And by the way, he hasn't been able to access that ranch in Montana for three years or the West Palm Beach or the, you see. Yet people, they live as though they're not gonna die. I remember the day that uh, I was gonna speak uh, at a men's conference up in the San Bernardino Mountains, Southern California. I flew in the Burbank, got in the car, I got it on news radio and it comes over the radio that Steve Jobs had just died. I thought, wow. The verse that came to my mind was Mark 8, 36. For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I mean, I was just thinking about that, driving all the way up there. Gosh. And the next day, we did a question and answer period right after lunch. And, you know, just to give, I've been giving him a lot of content. And, you know, you break up the conference a little bit. And someone mentioned Steve Jobs, and I said, yeah, I heard that yesterday. And, and I said, and when I heard that, the, the first thing that came to my mind was, was the verse in Mark, and I quoted it. And there was a guy, I, I would say he was probably a senior in high school, maybe, you know, first year college. I quoted that verse, and he said, I find that highly offensive. I said, really? He said, I think you're being very judgmental. I said, first of all, I didn't say that. The Lord Jesus Christ said that. I was just simply quoting what he said. I was just simply quoting God. For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world, as Steve Jobs did, and lose his own soul? What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Doesn't mean we don't work. But what it means is that we understand there's more to life than what is going on on this earth. We, we live in a secular culture, secular education system, secular government. And today, the context of secular, it, it really means this. When you say that someone is secularized, what you're saying is they believe, they believe this is the only world that there is. But see, Jesus said there's another world. There is another world. Jeremiah 9, real quick. What happens is that um, when the Lord gets a hold of someone's life, he changes their heart. And when their eyes are open and when they're converted and they're born again, the spiritual blindness goes away. And there is this wonderful passage in Jeremiah 9. And it says this. You'll find it in verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, says the Lord. The scripture says it's hard for a rich man to enter in to the kingdom of God. It, it's easier to go through the eye of a needle because money, we, we got to have money. You got to have it, but money can get a grip on you. Joe Lewis, the old heavyweight champ, once said, I don't love money actually, but it has a way of calming my heart. <laughs> That's just a good line. Doesn't money just have a way of calming your heart? Yeah, why? Because we got to have it. You got to pay your rent. You got to pay your tax. You got to pay. Yeah. And when we don't have it, there's all kinds of stress and anxiety. The problem is it can become an idol. It can become a God. And we are warned in 1 Timothy 6, those who are rich in this present world are warned that it's a danger and a trap and a snare. Why? Because it grabs your heart. 
But you see, when the Lord gets a hold of somebody's heart, and this would take us to the third principle. And the third principle is spiritual blindness is cured by spiritual conversion, which means you continually come and believe in Christ. That's John 6, 30 to 33. There are people who are wealthy, and I, I, I've known of some, and personally, who've met Christ, and everything changed in their life. Because, the, and they've always been hardworking and shrewd in business and all of this. But what happened was that the spiritual blindness dropped off and suddenly they have a different perspective and what they're working for is just not in regard to earth, but it's in regard to eternity. I have talked with some personally and how they have set themselves up is that they have enough for what they need. Everything else that comes in goes into the kingdom of God and to ministries around the world. Because their whole this perspective, they're working for the kingdom of God. They're working for the glory of God. You, you see what happens when, when we're born again, when Christ comes into our lives, the spiritual darkness is taken away. And, and what happens, if any man, 1 Corinthians 5, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. And, and what happens is, is, is that your whole perspective suddenly begins to change because you've been born again and now you're not spiritually blind but now you're you're born with a new heart and you're beginning the process of becoming mature in Christ and you're in the process of becoming a mature man in Christ and your your strategy and your value system it it all changes it all changes back in John Notice, if you would, when Jesus talks about their hearts and when he begins to make these statements to them in 27, don't work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? They think there's something they can do to get this, to earn it. Jesus answered and said to them, 29, this is the work of God, watch this, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? Well, what about yesterday? Didn't they see a sign the day before? Oh yeah, they did. But see, well, they're interested in another road show. They're interested in another sign. They're not interested in who he is. They're just interested in their own self-interest and what they can get out of this roadshow. 30. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Now watch this. This gets really interesting. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. So they're going back to the Old Testament. And for 40 years, God provided manna and there were two million men, women, and children, and he basically fed them. Each morning there was manna waiting for them, and that's how he took care, care of them and provided for them for 40 years. And in essence, what they're doing, they are now going back to what they did in John 5, and they're comparing Jesus to Moses, and they're saying, Jesus, you're deficient, because you fed us yesterday, but Moses would feed them every day for 40 years. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, and Jesus is gonna correct them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. In other words, it's me. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. He's the bread of life. He's above all earthly powers. 
But see, the blindness is there. But what happens when the Lord takes away the blindness in their spiritual conversion? What happens? Everything changes. Our, 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 our view on our money, our view on our future, our view on our retirement, our view on our health, our view on everything changes because of who he is and because he's above all earthly powers. When we get physically sick, when we get physically depleted, there's a point where that can affect us emotionally, uh, especially guys. We don't like being sick. We're healthy. We, we're out getting our stuff done and doing what we do and all that. We, the last thing we want to do is be in bed. And then we expect to get better, and then you don't get better quite as fast, and then, you know, you're going to be in this a little bit longer and all that, and, and suddenly you start fighting off a little bit of uh, discouragement and depression and all that. How do you fight that stuff off? I mean, really, I mean, how do you do it? You, you fight it off with the Word of God and with the truth about who He is, that He's above all earthly powers, that my life is in His hands. And, and I've shown you the Isaiah passage. The older I get, the more I love this uh, passage in Isaiah 46. Uh, do you ever think at all about your financial future? Do you ever think at all about, you know, the Federal Reserve and their wisdom? My gosh, could we take any more wisdom? You think about your financial future because that stuff counts. So, you know, that's kind of a worry the older you get. You want to make sure you're wise and you want to make sure you, you are using your head and you're thinking straight. I love Isaiah 46. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. I actually quoted this to myself last week in bed because I was fighting off some discouragement. You who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb, even to your old age, I will be the same. You know the problem with old age? You're not the same. I mean, I got on an escalator the other day and pulled a hamstring. I have to stretch before I get on an escalator. No, that's kind of a, yeah, it's a joke, but it's, not, it's also not a joke. Because stuff we never think twice about, you think twice about, don't you? Why? Because you're not the same, you're older. Even to your old age. See, we get worried about this because I'm not the same as I was. Well, you may not be the same, but look at this. Even to your old age, I will be the same. Even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it. Look at I've done it your whole life. And I will carry you. And I will bear you. And I will deliver you. That's a promise from Almighty God who's above all earthly powers. That's how you fight off discouragement. That's how you fight off worry about your financial future. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, what if this happens and what if that happens? Well, God can do this and this and things I haven't even thought about or considered. I mean, I don't know. He's promised to take care of me. And I've seen him do it. I saw him do it with my grandfather when I was a kid. My grandfather had pastored churches his entire life. Never really had a dime. The Lord got him through. And when I was probably 12, my grandfather had, you know, saved some money and was able to buy a little fourplex in Los Angeles and rented it to uh, retired missionaries on furlough. And he and my grandma lived in one and the other three units were these missionaries that were home from Venezuela or whatever. There was a school, elementary school next door. I go over there when we visited, I'd shoot baskets. And he, my grandfather started thinking about my grandmother and her health. They didn't have health insurance. So he went over and applied for a night job as a custodian so that they get health insurance in case she got sick. And six months later, he came down with cancer. And six months later, he was dead. See, she wasn't the one who needed the health insurance, it was him. But when he needed it, it was there. And he died and went to be with the Lord, and a year later to the day, she died and went to be with the Lord. Because they were pretty tight. And they've been with the Lord together in heaven since, what, 63? And, and they're doing really well really well. 
See, that's how you calm yourself down when all this stuff is going on around us that seems out of control. Fourth point, and then the fifth point very quickly. The fourth point is this. When Christ saves you, when you are spiritually converted, he is calling you to bring order out of chaos. He's calling you to bring order out of chaos. Here's what we see. We see the whole world in rebellion to the Lord. Tim Challenge did a great article a couple of years ago. And, and I've taken this title from him. It's your calling hyphen is to bring order out of chaos as a Christian man. And then he talks about the fact that, uh, you know, at their house, he works in the home and his wife, you know, and their kids are in school and everything's pretty quiet. Everything's pretty under control until about 320. And then about 325, all, I mean, everything is just falling apart in that home. Uh, all the order, all the quiet, all the, it's, it's over. It's done with because the kids are home from school. Um, and then as you go through the rest of the day, it's the job of the parents. You try to restore order out of the chaos, and that's just life. That's how it works. In terms of this world, in terms of this world, God created a perfect world, absolutely perfect. But the woman and her husband listened to the lie of the deceiver, and he said that God was a liar, and they believed him, and sin came into the world, and, this, and there's been disorder ever since. And all this sin and all this pain and all this heartache is because of the rebellion that took place in the garden. Oh, and then in the New Testament, Jesus comes, and Jesus comes, and he gives his life as an atonement for our sin, and then he gives the great commission to the disciples. It says, go into all the world, make disciples of every creature. In other words, preach the good news, tell them the truth about who I am, and then you get the book of Acts and establish churches. In other words, what's going to happen here? I've done a work, I've done a work in you, and what I want you to do is to go tell them what I've done, and I want you to bring order out of the disorder. And then he says to husbands in Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's quite a high order. That's our job. And then he's got family relationships, how we're to live our lives. And what, what, what God does for us is that as we live in this world of disorder, he wants us as Christian men to be instruments of his to bring order into a world of disorder. And this is what we have the opportunity to do right now. Because there's so much disorder everywhere around us. Flip over real quick to Titus. This is a direct word for men. In, in Titus chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, But as for you, speak to things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Watch this. Older men are to be temperate or sober. It means there's a restraint in indulging desires. Older men, older Christian men are to be restrained. They are to be dignified or they are to have what's known as gravitas. There's a gravity about an older Christian man. There is a, a dignity. There is a weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, a, a weight of credibility. There is a weight of authority. There is a weight of credibility because those who know him and live with him see congruency between what he teaches and what he purports to believe and how he lives his life. When you see a man's life match up with how, what that man says, there's congruency, there is integrity, there is, there is a structural strength to that man's life and to his character. 
and, and he doesn't have to say much, but when he speaks, they listen. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, self-controlled. Watch this, sound in faith. That's why we read our Bibles. That's why we study our Bibles. We want to be sound in faith. I can't be sound in faith if I don't know what's in the Word of God. I can't have peace about my financial future if I don't know Isaiah 46.3. If I think it's all hinging on what's going to happen over the next three months or something, if I think it's all out of God, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Hey, we're good. We're good. God made a way for my grandpa. He'll make a way for me. I've already seen him make a way for me. My kids have seen him make a way over the years. See, you know him. You trust him. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible. Watch this. Sound in faith. And then sound in love. You're not running around chasing chicks. You're a godly man. You're a man of God. You're committed to your wife. Committed to your children, to your grandkids. You're a stabilizing factor. Maybe you were a hellraiser back when, but you're not anymore because Jesus is in your heart and he's got a hold of you. And that's your legacy. And you'd no more betray your wife than you'd betray Christ because of what Christ has done for you. And because they're watching, all those little eyes are watching. And there's all this stuff around them that is wrong and is immoral and is wicked and is godless. And you're called to bring order where there's disorder. What a calling and what a privilege. That's our task. <laughs> And they're going to remember you way after you're with the Lord. They're going to remember. And because of, of the Lord and his goodness in our lives, as we get older, our lives get better. Doesn't mean we're free of sickness. It means, doesn't mean that we don't ever have any mental issues. Doesn't mean that. But it means because of the quality of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and the quality of relationship with those we love and the integrity that's there, there is a benefit that is there in our lives that God brings favor and blessing as a result of that. Does that make sense? It makes all kinds of sense. And then he says in 6, likewise, just urge the young men to be sensible. Well, how do you urge the young men to be sensible? By watching you be sensible. You be sensible. Or you have a conversation with them and a you know, young guy, I shouldn't have done that, it was a dumb thing. Well, so let me tell you what I did when I was your age. Seriously? Yeah. Let me tell you the biggest screw up I ever did in my whole life. Really? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you about it. Gosh, I never thought you'd do anything like that. Oh, I did. And see what happens is you just start you just don't share your strengths, you share your failures. But you share what the Lord did in your life. I, I used to be, the, I, I remember when I was, I, I, I remember you're what, 37? I remember when I was 37. One of the hardest years I ever had. But the Lord taught me some lessons that were invaluable for the rest of my life and that's what he's doing in your life right now. But he wants you to be teachable. What a privilege to have conversations like that. And the whole world's falling apart, and what are you doing? You're an emissary of Christ and a representative of Christ to your family. <laughs> I love this stuff. Because this is, this is why we're alive. This is why we exist. Oh, and, and the last thing. And you, you never thought I'd say those words. And I, actually, I'm going to take them back. As soon as I said it, I, was, I regretted it. But number five, the last point was three truths about spiritually blind people. Because it is true that all of us in here, there are people we love that are so far away from the Lord. And quite frankly, they have such hard hearts and such resentment and such cynicism and sarcasm. And, and at times it looks, you, you almost lose hope. 
you, you, you all, you don't even know how to pray. I want to show you three things here in John 6. The first one is in verse 37. John 6, 37. Uh, this is some great stuff. And remember, this comes from the Lord Jesus Christ who is above all earthly powers. Oh Lord, I hope, I, I, I pray that they'll come. Oh, they're so far away from you, they have no interest in you. Okay, look at John 6, verse 37. 37, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. That's an amazing statement. We are, we are chosen in Christ and all that the Father gives me will come. Every single one. Doesn't matter where they are right now. It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter what their attitude is. It doesn't matter this or that. It doesn't matter because they're coming because it's irresistible grace. It's irresistible grace. It cannot be resisted because the Father is determined to give that individual to Christ the Son. So don't lose hope. Well, I don't even know what to say. Well, then don't say anything. Just as your burden to pray, just pray for him. And I'm not even quite sure how to pray. Well, then just say, Father, I'm not sure how to pray, but I put them in your hands. I ask you to bring them in at the right time. You brought me in. See, we think, we think that anyone can come to Christ anytime they want to, and that's not true. Psalm 14 makes it very clear. There is no one who seeks God. There is no one who does good. The, the fact is, we're not interested in him. And you say, yeah, but, well, I came to him. I sought him. Yeah, yes, that's true. But we love him because he first what? Loved us. See, he, we didn't go after him. He came after us. That's why John Newton wrote Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. And he was a wretch. He raped those slave women on those ships, threw them overboard, murdered them. I mean, he was a wretch. Became one of the great pastors of the British Empire and helped break the back of slavery in the British Empire. And when William Wilberforce said, I want to become a pastor, he said, no, you stay in Parliament. And Wilberforce was the guy who broke the back because he was counseled by a sensible, mature, godly man who had been a wretch, who had discovered the grace of God. But all that the Father gives to me will come. So if there's a burden, you pray. Because all who were chosen will come. Secondly, all who were chosen will never be rejected. Chapter 6, verse 37, the same verse. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So keep praying. Keep praying. Well, well I may die before they come to know the Lord. You may die before they come to know the Lord. My, my, my grandfather that I spoke of, there were at least two family members that were as far away from the Lord as they possibly would be when he died. Years later, they came to the Lord. And one recently just had a funeral and made sure the gospel was preached at that funeral. All who were chosen will come. Secondly, all who were chosen will never be rejected. That's 637. And thirdly, all who are chosen are eternally safe. Verses 39 to Father. Jesus said, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. 
Doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, what you, doesn't matter. So keep praying. Just keep praying. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. We're, we're living in times of incredible disorder and chaos, but we thank you for the order and for the hope and for the encouragement you give us out of your word. Help us to hold these truths tight in our hearts tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.